Welcome to Science Goes to the Movies, a look at the stories of science and how they change our culture. I'm Lisa Beth Kovitz. This year, Arthur Conan Doyle's four novels and 56 short stories about Sherlock Holmes will become public domain. In preparation for the deluge of Holmes stories, I am delighted to play Dr. Watson to neuroscientist, author, and professor, Dr. Stuart Firestein, as we discuss Sherlock Holmes and methods of logical reasoning. Stuart, welcome back to the show. Well, it's such a pleasure to be here. I always enjoy these conversations, and I enjoy watching the show online and everywhere else, so it's great. Thank you so much. Nice to be in this seat for a change. If I say Sherlock Holmes, you probably think Calabash Pipe and nobody wears a deerstalker hat in the city. And of course, deductive reasoning. But when Sherlock Holmes enters a crime scene, he does not reach a conclusion until after he assesses the clues. Is that deductive reasoning? No, that is not <laughs> deductive reasoning. It just sounds good, deductive reasoning, I think. I've deduced this, so there you go, you know. It would be what we call inductive reasoning, in fact, where you look at the data first, then come up with a theory, set of ideas, and then try and make a generalization out of all of the evidence you can collect, which is what, of course, Holmes generally does. And despite being culturally known for deductive reasoning in A Scandal in Bohemia, Sherlock himself said, it is a capital mistake to theorize before one has data. Insensibly, one begins to twist facts to suit theories instead of theories to suit facts. That probably sounds better with a British accent, but it also... <laughs> it still sounds good. <laughs> But that does sound dangerous to twist your facts to suit your theories. This is, this is a very common and well-known um, effect in science that we worry about all the time. Yes, it's what we call confirmation bias. I mean, it goes on in lots of places, but it's most dangerous, I think, in science. Richard Feynman, the famous physicist, was once famously said, the purpose of science is to not fool yourself, and you are the easiest person to fool. And that's true, and we have to watch out for that, because we do tend to see, if you come up with a theory, if you come up with a hypothesis, then you tend to notice the things that confirm it, and you somehow or another find ways to dismiss the mm -hmm. things that don't. So we rely on inductive reasoning, which is nowhere near as dependable. You can make lots of mistakes with inductive reasoning, but that's the price you pay. So we've got deductive reasoning, we've got inductive reasoning, but then there's also something called abductive reasoning, which I'm going to assume has something to do with my abdominal muscles, right, Stuart? No, <laughs> nor does that have anything to do with your being abducted by aliens. <laughs> Although either of those definitions would be in many ways more suitable than what it does mean, because I have no idea where the word abduction comes to, des to describe this kind of logic. Well, I think, I think it comes from the Latin, it, to right, abduce, yeah, to take right. away. Yes, yes. So, so what it really relies on is the notion of just sort of regression, I guess you would call it a reversion to the best explanation. You see a little bit of data, you see something going on, and you come up with what you think is the best explanation, the most likely explanation for it, and then you kind of take that one and use it until it's disproven. Do you want an example? I do. Terry and Peter are in a relationship, uh, but you've heard they've broken up. They've had a big breakup and they've broken up two weeks ago. But then one day you see them in the park riding bicycles together. So your abductive reasoning is, oh, they must have gotten back together again. Now that may not be true at all. It may be that Terry and Peter were also partners in a business, and they needed to tie up some loose ends, and they decided we'll meet in the park and ride bikes because we're still friends and we'll fix this up, right? It has nothing to do with getting together again. That's abductive reasoning. That's messy. Messy, very messy. messy. But we use it all the time. We, and we use it in science as well. <laughs> Just to, to give you another, another weird word, since we're into weird words we in, this, uh, in this particular episode, another example of, of abductive reasoning and dangerous reasoning, I would say, that nonetheless scientists use all the time is something called Occam's razor. So Occam's razor, which is about as weird a set of words as we're probably going to come up with. Not about shaving. Not about shaving at all. It's from Sir William Occam, but the, it's basically the principle of what's called parsimony. That is, you should always favor the simplest explanation over a more complicated one. And we think this is true in science, that you should use a simple explanation. If there are two explanations, one is complicated, one simple, use the simple one, it's probably right. There's really no evidence that that's the case. And I was, I was disabused of Occam's razor by a magician friend of mine named Mark Minton, a professional magician. We were having a discussion one night and Occam's razor came up somehow or another. And Mark just like that said, oh, Occam's razor, yeah, the magician's best friend. And I thought, well, that can't be. How can Occam's razor be the magician's best friend and a principle of scientific 
logic. Um, because magicians are in the, I mean, I like magic as much as the next person, but their business is deception and ours is right. hopefully revealing things. So I realized, I think Occam's razor is a very bad idea. Yeah, because if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it could very well be an automated <laughs> decoy with that's sound. Right. Yes, that's, that's exactly right. There are always other explanations, and the simple one will, you know, throw you off. Using logic, Sherlock Holmes sticks to the principle that once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. And episode after episode, that works like gangbusters because a highly skilled team of godlike writers wills it to be so, but... Let's talk real life causation. You want to throw correlation in there as correlation. well, just to, just to really <laughs> it's hit all the seeds. The issue. Yes. Well, this is a, this is always a, a problem in trying to determine um, whether how deeply you really understand a thing or an explanation. So you can have, it's especially, I guess, important these days with things like artificial intelligence and machine learning, because now we can take a huge number of correlations, which are not considered as as strong as causation. If you really know that smoking causes lung cancer, because you can see these steps in which the, the, the ingredients in smoke cause cells to do this and turn cancerous, that's causation. You have it sealed. If, on the other hand, what you have is that a lung cancer is far more prevalent among smokers than non-smokers, you have correlation. And that doesn't seal the deal, especially if you're a tobacco manufacturer and you, you, know, you want to push the envelope. So correlation is not as strong as causation. On the other hand, now we have supercomputers and AI and, and machine learning that can do massive, massive numbers of correlations, so many that it virtually becomes causation, it seems to me. Virtually. Yes. And what are we talking about when we say virtually? Because are we talking about the public understanding or are we talking about a hard science? Like if we keep repeating it, do we start to believe it or are you saying that it starts to become real? Well, I think, I think you can have, I mean, you, you begin to have more faith in it. You have to talk about sort of odd to think about in science, but sort of levels of faith or maybe levels of belief, right? So if the correlations are stronger and stronger and stronger, and you at some point say, you know, this is 99 point some odd percent likely to be the case, then I'll take that, right? If it's only 70%, I'm not as sure I'll take it, but I might, you know. So you have to learn to kind of embrace a level of uncertainty that just will always be there. You have to see uncertainty as a valuable thing, not something that creates anxiety and misery and we'd like to be without. You know, a world of certainty would not be that much fun. <laughs> if you knew everything was going to happen according to some clockwork formula, well, does it Would that be interesting? So let me ask you your opinion. Do you think that some of the issues that we're we're having in America with um, outlier theories and 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 conspiracies, do you think some of that is a desire for something to be controllable and 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 not a maybe? Yes. Yes, I think very much so. I mean, I think we are in some ways stuck in this sort of 19th century deterministic view of the universe as being some clockwork mechanism that, you know, ticks away and has since the beginning of time and will continue ticking away and, you know, will always tell the right time, supposedly. But I find that a very interesting, boring place to live, really, isn't it? So, so I think we should think twice about it. But yes, I think there's a, there's a piece of our brain that likes certainty, that would like to know this is the way to go. Um, doctors face this all the time. You know, they, they will come to a patient with three or four choices of a treatment. And patients don't want that. They want to know, well, what do you think, doc? Sure. What would you do? Well, you I, know, I, I, yeah. We all do that, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'd like to know this is the way to go. Yeah, we'd like our experts to be... Infallible. <laughs> yeah. But infallible is always bad. That's, that leads down bad roads. Final solutions, infallibility. Those are terms, those things never turn out right. Sherlock Holmes and really all of our crime dramas lean heavily into abductive reasoning. When they enter a crime scene and the kettle is still burning and the porridge is still hot, the detectives take away or abduce certain logical assumptions about what happened to form a hypothesis and then start down the path towards what we often call the scientific method. Stuart, what is the scientific method and why are you so against it? 
<laughs> Apparently my reputation precedes me. Um, I'm not totally against it. I just think it's misused a great deal. I mean, the scientific method says, you know, you make an observation, then you come up with a hypothesis about this observation, then you test it, and you revise your hypothesis and make new observations. You kind of do that ad nauseum, I guess, until you're satisfied that you have a correct hypothesis. So there are a number of things that are problematic about that, one of which we sort of started the conversation with, which is it leads to confirmation bias. You come up with a hypothesis, then you're going to, you're going to influence the observations you make. And, and you're going to make observations that are in line with your hypothesis. Because we all love our little cute hypotheses, right? They're our smart little idea about how it all works, you know. And so it le can lead easily to that. Um, also, you know, we teach it as though this is the way scientists work, but, but nobody tells you how to do the most important part of it, which is come up with a hypothesis. I mean, where do you do that? Was there a book somewhere? You look them up? This is the key to it, and nobody tells you how to do that. So it makes it sound like there's a recipe when there is no recipe. There is no simple method for doing this. Now, the scientific method can be used post hoc. Sometimes you make a discovery, you come up with something, you find out about it, you've got the hypothesis, you've got the observations, then you may apply the scientific method to sort of be extra rigorous about it. That could happen. It's a wonderful article written by Peter Medawar, who was a famous immunologist, passed away a number of years ago. He was known as the Carl Sagan of, of England, actually. He was very good at popularizing science. He wrote an article for a popular audience called, Is the Scientific Paper a Fraud? And the answer is yes, <laughs> shockingly, because it's never presented in the order in which the discoveries were made, right? We present it in a narrative that's now sensible and possible to understand. But quite often, the data in figure one is the stuff you found out last, and the data in figure four is the stuff you accidentally found out first, you know? So it's never presented. In, so. It's not a fraud, of course, in the sense that it's untrue, but it's not an accurate presentation of the way in which the discovery was made. But we, but then we start to want it to be that way. The lay people and the general public want that. Yes, and so you, yeah, and, and indeed scientists even write the papers that way. They write this, this, this happened, and then we reason that. And from that moment on, you know it's bull. Sorry to use that word again. <laughs> um, pull out our bleeper because, again. Because we don't generally do it that way. We come at it from many different angles, and eventually it begins to fall into place, it if is, you're lucky. It is nice in this, in, in this latest uh, Holmes iteration, Enola Holmes, that you see them discover clues that they don't think are important, but they hold on to, and then those clues become quite significant as the whole thing falls together. I think that we are starting to give our... Uh, super sleuths and maybe our scientists a little more leeway uh, to understand things in in the way that you're describing and not in the uh, yes. the, the the pretty science way. Yes, so that would be that would be definitely an improvement. Of course, in the end, part of the problem is that in the end, Holmes does always solve the mystery. And you know, there is you do put the pieces in the puzzle, and the manufacturer has guaranteed that the puzzle can be solved somehow, or the producer has, in this case, the writer. Whereas in science, we don't have that guarantee. I mean, we may not resolve it. You know, most of our guests' research has to do with the vertebrate olfactory receptor neurons. Okay, what the heck does that? Mean? Oh, yeah. Well, let's unpack that one, I guess. Uh, well, vertebrates you get, that's a backbone. So so we look at the, the, instead of, I mean, other animals have olfactory systems, sense of smell, insects, which are not vertebrates, right? Okay. So, but I don't work on that. My laboratory is only interested in vertebrates, which would include everything from amphibians to us. And um, olfactory, of course, the sense of smell. And receptor neurons are neurons in your nose that have receptors on them that are able to bind to and detect odors. And it's kind of like a lock and key sort of thing. If you think of the receptor as a protein that has a funny shape to it, but it has a particular shape. And then molecules, you know, things that smell have a shape to them as well. They're chemicals, they're molecules. So if the molecule sort of fits into the receptor that says, Ho brain, I've found this molecule. On the other hand, if you have a receptor like that, it's not going to fit, yeah. but this molecule will fit. And it says, oh, brain, I have a different molecule. That's the quick version of it. OK, so if you're tasked with finding out with, say, why after COVID our noses no longer smell things, how would you lay out the 
the investigation, Mr. Holmes. That's really remained an incredible mystery, uh, I have to say. Um, and I, I mean, I can tell you ways that we have looked at it and people have been looking at it and it remains a huge mystery just because of the way it happens. It's not so unusual to lose your sense of smell as a result of a respiratory virus, cold or something like that, you know, a stuffed up nose and so forth. But in this case, the sense of smell disappeared days before any other symptoms showed up, right? So you were not symptomatic for COVID, but lost your sense of smell. And it seemed to be sudden. You'd like sit down to breakfast and have pancakes and you go, these taste like cardboard. I don't, they have no taste. Really, it was your sense of smell that was gone, by the way, not your sense of taste because most of what we call taste is flavor, which is really your sense of smell. If you took person with COVID who said they lost their sense of taste and put sugar or salt on their tongue, they would taste it. Yeah. But they couldn't taste their food. They couldn't, they had no sense of flavor. So why it disappeared before symptoms even arrived, we don't know. And why we recover, most people, not everybody, but why most people recovered their sense of smell so quickly after the symptoms were gone, after they were uh, uh, had been cured of COVID, um, we don't know either. And we don't know why all of the other variants don't cause this loss of sense of smell, only some do. So it's a, it's a huge mystery. We've looked at tissue. I mean, part of the problem is that it seems only humans lose their sense of smell with COVID. Mice, for example, don't. And so we couldn't use mice. And so that some of the experiments we might do, kind of you can't do on humans, you know, for ethics and things like that. That's a problem. You know? <laughs> so um, so well, we used uh, post-mortem tissue from unfortunate victims of COVID and we would recover nasal tissue. We could never, we and other laboratories, not just my laboratory, but many other laboratories, could never really find anything definitive wrong with these nasal tissues from uh, victims of COVID. So it remains a mystery to this day. As the Sherlock Holmes multiverse becomes more commercially successful, it's also getting sanitized. And in Netflix's most recent installment of Enola Holmes, Sherlock's original addiction to cocaine, courtesy of Arthur Conan Doyle, has become an addiction to puzzles. Luckily, our guest is a neuroscientist. So what do puzzles do to the brain that makes them so addictive? Puzzles certainly are addictive. Curiosity is. Mm -hmm. One of those things that people are now beginning to study curiosity. Actually, I have to say one of the things I find most interesting about curiosity, which is a little different than puzzles, but, but it's the same sort of thing, is actually how quickly curiosity can be satisfied. Um, you know, somebody says, well, I'm really curious about that. And you say, oh, well, it's this, this, and that. And they go, oh, okay, that's good. And they're done with it, you know, and I'm thinking... <laughs> No, you, that should increase your curiosity. That should take you to the next level of curiosity. It often doesn't. Curiosity can be surprisingly easily satiated, which surprises me. But, but puzzles are indeed addictive somehow or another. And I, I don't know why. It's interesting that they are. Um, I, it's something I have to look into because I wonder whether animals are, are addicted to puzzles as well. I wonder how long they'll work at a puzzle as well. Um, I mean, there are ways to test this and, you know, and with dogs, with, with uh, primates. Going back to that or, concept you know. of certainty, I like a puzzle, especially like a, a, a crossword puzzle kind of yeah. thing where A works because B has to work also. Yes. That makes me feel that there's certainty and order in the universe. Uh, well, so that could be it. There's a satisfaction when it clicks together suddenly at the yeah. end, when the various elements come together and you see, oh, this is a grand scheme, a grand design. The concept of abductive reasoning was advanced by philosopher Charles Sanders Peirce in the late 19th century. Charles Sanders Peirce needed a better marketing team because the name does not easily explain what it is. And this idea of naming something equals explaining something was addressed in one of our guests' papers published in The Edge. Stuart, what is a nominal fallacy? Ah, yes, very common thing, and, and it's, it's very simple, really, which is that we believe by having given something a name, we have also explained it, and we can now put it aside and move on, when we probably haven't explained it, or we've now um, left it to be ever, never explained properly. This happened with gravity. Newton himself said, there is this force, this strange force where two bodies attract each other um, over great distances and instantaneously. I have no idea what it is. I mean, he said that. I cannot imagine what this force is. I'll call it gravity. Here, I can tell you how it works. It has to do with the mass of the two bodies and the distance between them and all of that works out, but he did not know what the force was. We just call it gravity. We're perfectly happy with that. But, but it's not an explanation of what it is. 
Einstein eventually did explain what it is with relativity. And is the problem that that we stop looking because we think we're done because we've named it? Yes, I think that often is the problem. So you get you either get the result you think you should have had and then you move on or you name something and you put it away. I'll give you another quick example. I, I hope it's quick anyway. Um, the <laughs> word instinct, I find, is a very dangerous word because it's one of these words that shrinks with knowledge, if you will. It's w what it covers. So kind of any behavior, we look at animal behavior and we go, I don't know how it learned to do that, or I can't figure out how that came about, so I'll call it instinct. You know, it's part of the nature-nurture argument, which itself is a nominal fallacy, probably. So, as a quick example, when chickens are born, little chicks hatch, and the first thing they do when they come out of the egg is peck the ground. Where would they learn that? I mean, this looks like an instinctive behavior. And so it was thought for years. In the 1920s, a Chinese scientist named Kuo did this marvelous experiment. It turns out if you take hot Vaseline, you rub it on an egg, it will make, and, and look through the egg with a bright light, it will make the chicken egg transparent. And you can observe the embryo developing in the chicken egg without disturbing it. So he did this. And what he saw was that the chicken, in order to fit into the egg, its head is actually over its chest. It's bent over its chest. And in the last week of development, as the heart begins beating, the head is pushed up and down and up and down on the beating heart. So in exactly the same movement that it uses to peck the ground. So it spent the last week of its embryonic life learning how to move okay. its head like this. And it does, it's not instinct. Right. So a nominal fallacy also seems like a kind of terrible power play because you say, well, they're doing that because it's their instinct or, or uh, she doesn't get along with the team because she's difficult. If we give these people their, th these names, yes. it's not really addressing the issue, the truth, or anything that can be fixed. Yes, yeah, so there's no depth to it. I mean, you've just yeah. named it and you, you know, it, there's, there's no logic behind any of this. In Enola Holmes, we get to see lots of Holmes family enemies using logical fallacies, including repeated ad hominem explanations to Sherlock's little sister Enola that she could not possibly be a good detective because she is a girl. Are ad hominem fallacies always so mean-spirited? Uh, not always. They often are. Um, they're a way of attacking people that are commonly used, you know, the whatever it might be, you're, you're a girl, you're a woman, you're this or that, and therefore how could you possibly know this or the other thing? Um, they are not always, I mean, we do use them in ways that are complimentary. Calling somebody an expert could be an ad hominem reason to listen to what they have to say. Um, and so that would be okay if they're an expert. Are there any major ad hominem fallacies in scientists, in science? Oh, that's a good question. Um, Yes, I suppose there must be. I'm trying to think of a couple off the top of my head. Well, I can certainly think of, of one of, of how a lay person views a scientist in that, I mean, it's a pos again, a somewhat positive thing. He's, well, but he's a scientist or well, but he's an expert. Yes, yes, so, and that's, one hopes a positive thing, <laughs> not always. So, sometimes people seem to mean that as a, as a critique. So in that sense, it would be an ad hominem attack. Certainly scientists do this with each other. I mean, we have, <laughs> You know, we all have some bias about some laboratory that's put papers out and then they kind of don't hold up and this and that. You know, make a big deal out of it, but you can't get them to hold up and then you don't take their next set of results as, you know, as seriously. Is that a fallacy or is... No, I think it's a way that we work. You know, you develop a certain intuition, if you will, a certain sense of how to judge expertise, of how to judge the work that you see. I mean, I wish we could teach more people this. I think we do need to teach more people this. This is what I think we mean by, you know, a critical attitude towards what you hear in, in the world, on, in the newspaper, on television, wherever it might be, having a critical attitude. It doesn't mean having a, being critical of it in the sense of, you know, denying its truth or something, but to be critical of understanding whether this is valuable information or whether this is slightly suspect information. Okay, so how would a scientist um, recognize a fallacy? And I'll start with the ad hominem, name calling. If there's name calling involved, there's probably not a lot of information, of, of, of actual truth underneath. Yes, I think that's probably the case. And so, yeah, we wouldn't pay as much attention to that as to somebody saying, well, I tried to replicate this experiment and I was unable to do so. Can you explain this to me? So, um, 
So this is one way to judge it. I mean, there's one way to look for a, a scientific fallacy or somebody who's dreamt up a theory that seems quite marginal and doesn't really have the data to support it. I mean, this was true in the AIDS epidemic. There was a scientist who denied that AIDS was a virus, thought it was, I think, a fungus or some crazy thing like that. But he had he, the the mountain of evidence was on the other side of things. And, and yet he, you know, there was this problem of fair and balanced business, you know. And so he wound up with a voice in the, in the media because he was always opposed to the viral theory of AIDS until it was proven beyond a doubt that that was how AIDS was, was spread. Well, going back to Sherlock Holmes, Holmes would say that was extremely wrong to start out with your, the your theory and, and, yes. and then go find evidence to yes. support it. Yes, and, and he never really did have the evidence to support it, but nonetheless had a voice somehow or another. It was given this voice because there was a time when it was believed that, you know, one, that, that to report things fairly, you should always have the opposing point of view. But, you know, we know that that's not really true. There are opposing points of view that have no grounding whatsoever. Red herring, straw man, slippery slope, post hoc, there are many types of logical fallacies that have been named and categorized, but when it gets right down to it, how can a lay person recognize a logical fallacy? It's not always easy, but it's, it's doable. You look at the source of the information you're getting. You look at whether it's been vetted. You look at, I mean, is this person in the employ of a corporation? Where's the money coming from that supported this research? Um, uh, what's the past level of research that came out of this laboratory or this person's work or the work of their students and progeny, people who have gone on? Have they been attacking this for years and years and just keep hammering away at the same thing? Um, is there a way to disprove them? I think that's one of the most important things. Is there a way, do they understand? Are they willing to be disproved? Are they willing to say, here are ways to disprove this if people want to try it? So beware of people who are certain. Yes, there's a great quote from André Gide, the poet, who says, I'll probably get it wrong, but I'm paraphrasing slightly, who said, follow those who seek the truth, flee from those who claim to have found it. I am so sorry that we are out of time. It is such a pleasure to talk to you. It was a good ending. <laughs> great ending. <laughs> this is a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me back, Lisa. It's always good to have you.